that it was within God's purposes that the Jewish people should have a home. There are some, of course, who will say that God has finished with Israel. Wars and rumors of wars. These are the birth pains of global change. In doing so, they opened the way for the restoration of the Jewish people to their ancient homeland. Did God reject his people? By no means. Romans 11, verse 1. That the destiny of Britain was actually to be the restorer of Israel, the Cyrus nation and the sovereign purposes of God. Prepare your hearts to receive the blessing of the Cyrus call. When God says a thing shall be done, we ought to believe it. Though these were not my words, nevertheless, we should settle them firmly in our minds. Shalom and welcome to Crosstalk. I am a Jewish believer in the God of Israel and the Jewish Messiah. My name is Randy Weiss, and through a partnership with the Hatikva Film Trust, you will now hear the Cyrus Call and you will be introduced to the man who said, when God says a thing shall be done, we ought to believe it. He spoke them in the specific context of recognizing way back in the 1800s that God is not done with the Jewish people. A British preacher read the Bible and came to understand that God was fully invested in a plan for the restoration of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. At that time, the notion was outrageous. In fact, to some it was scandalous. Well, guess what? It is still a scandal to most of the enemies of God and His people, but it is no longer outrageous. What seemed impossible in the 1800s is quite obviously a reality today. The restoration of my people to our ancient homeland is a holy work of a holy God. Christian missionaries, explorers, and inspired students of the Bible all contributed to the renewed interest in understanding Israel's connection to the end times and God's connection to Israel and the Jewish people. Through the Cyrus Call, we will learn more about this incredible history right now. The Palestine Exploration Fund was spreading far and wide across Britain. Many in the Bible colleges were encouraged as the accounts of the Bible were authenticated by archaeology, renewing the interest in eschatology. J.C. Ryle, who later became Bishop of Liverpool, was one of the foremost Bible teachers in the Anglican Church in the 19th century. In May 1868, he preached a sermon entitled, Scattered Israel to be Regathered. However great the difficulties surrounding many parts of unfulfilled prophecy, two minor points appear to my mind to stand out as clearly as if they were written by a sunbeam. One point is the second personal advent of our Lord Jesus Christ before the millennium. The other of these points is the future literal gathering of the Jewish nation and their restoration to their own land. Out of the 16 prophets of the Old Testament, there are at least 10 in which the gathering and restoration of the Jews in the latter days is expressly mentioned. I believe that there is one common remark that applies to them all. They all point to a time which is yet future, they all predict the final gathering of the Jewish nation from the four quarters of the globe and their restoration to their own land. I ask you then to settle it firmly in your mind that when God says a thing shall be done, we ought to believe it. Men like J.C. Ryle, Charles Spurgeon, and others inspired congregations throughout England to understand God was not done with Israel. The Cyrus call of God was becoming clear to those who studied His Word and understood the times in which they lived. Will we pay attention to the times in which we live?
The Cyrus Call continues. Will you hear it? There will be a native government again. There will be a form of body politic. A state shall be incorporated. And a king shall reign. Israel has become alienated from her own land. Her sons, though they can never forget the sacred dust of Palestine, yet die a hopeless distance from her consecrated shores. But it shall not be so forever. Her sons will rejoice in her again. Her land shall be called Beulah, for as a young man marries a virgin, so her sons shall marry her. I will place you in your own land, is God's promise to them. They are to have a national... In his sermon, Spurgeon went on to expound the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel chapter 37. In less than a hundred years, Ezekiel's prophecy, along with those of many other Old Testament prophets, would come to pass, and the state of Israel would be reborn in her own land, rising from the ashes of the Holocaust. Another prominent evangelical of the day, preaching on the restoration of Israel, was Henry Grattan Guinness. Henry Grattan was well known as an evangelist to huge crowds, and uh, uh, very clearly remarkable preacher during some of the revivals in the UK and also in the USA and in France. So he was traveling all over the place. They called him, the newspapers called him a rival to Spurgeon, didn't they? I mean, yeah. if there was such a thing as rivalry, actually, actually they were great friends. Yeah. And uh, uh, Henry Grattan eventually felt the call to the mission field, but met Hudson Taylor in Ireland, who said to him, I'd rather that you trained our missionaries who were going to go out there. So Henry Grattan set up a college in London called Harley House in the east end of London, in Bow, in a rough area, and began a, effectively a faith mission for training about 50 or more missionaries per annum uh, to go out to all parts of the world in the sort of new missionary ventures. And from that, he's beginning to do work that others have also done in seeing that God wants to restore the Jews to Israel. But currently, in his day, the Turkish Ottoman Empire is ruling there and oppressing Jews. So this is a longing that he sees in scripture, he sees it prophesied, and he's beginning to think wider thoughts about that, as well as mission uh, issues. So those two are going together. It's a, it's a great longing for God's missionary work to be done. In a moment, we will see the connection that was made among some of the greatest men of God of that era as they pursued the Cyrus call to work toward the restoration of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. For century after century in exile, the Jewish people recited the daily Amidah prayer, calling upon the Lord to regather the Jewish people from exile and one prayer every year at Passover, next year in Jerusalem. The whole Bible shows that God has a special affection for Israel. It's the final gathering of the Jewish nation from the four quarters who emerged from centuries of political obscurity. Britain's Cyrus role to pave the way for the restoration of the Jews to the Promised Land had begun. that the destiny of Britain was actually to be the restorer of Israel, the Cyrus nation in the sovereign purposes of God. And I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. If you're like me, you've probably heard that scripture since you were young. But one might ask, what does this really look like? Well. There are two ways that you can bless Israel in a very tangible way. One of those ways is to go. The other way is to plant trees. You see, Israel is a modern miracle in the desert of the Middle East. 
because believers like us plant trees. So I'll ask, do you want to bless Israel? For every $25 contribution that you make, we're going to plant a tree in your name and we'll send you a certificate that you can hang on the wall and display proudly that you're standing with and you have blessed Israel. So give me a call at 1-800-688-3422 or visit us on the web at crosstalk.org. Let us know how many trees you want to plant. And if you're able, join us on our next tour of the Holy Land and plant one with your own hand. As we know all too well through the centuries, anti-Semitism has led to horrifying destruction. But philo-Semitism, that love for the Jewish people that was blossoming in Great Britain during the mid to late 1800s, well, that would prove to be a very powerful force in the restoration of God's people to the land of Israel. Now, Grattan Guinness also, some of the links that he had were very far-reaching, particularly with, with the Earl of Shaftesbury. At their college, there was a fountain in the back garden. I mean, the East End was rough and it was depressed and the people were hungry and it was very run down. But they actually, they were one of the few places that had a little garden that was like an oasis with a pear tree. And people like Shaftesbury used to come and escape and sit in this garden and talk to Fanny, particularly Grattan Guinness's first wife, who was passionate about the fact that the Jews must be restored, so passionate that they were buying land in Israel whenever they could, because they believed at some point they would be able to give it back to the Jewish people at the right time. Not only that, she was saying to all their friends, William and Catherine Booth of the Salvation Army, regular friends who were there. Moody, when he came to this country, used to, um, Harley College was a base for him. And they all were in a network. Indeed, a vision for Israel's restoration was very prevalent in Britain. Throughout the 19th century, British society was philo-Semitic. Ironically, despite pockets of anti-Semitism, there was this expectation amongst the British population that the Jews would one day return to Palestine. And this, I think, was thanks uh, in part due to the influence of the Puritans and the influence of the evangelicals which was quite widespread. And you see it in the poetry of Lord Byron, who was certainly no evangelical, or in the novels of George Eliot, who again was no evangelical. Philosemitism was in the air, it was in the water of, of Victorian Britain. The restorationist vision spread across the Atlantic in part due to John Nelson Darby, who had founded the Plymouth Brethren back in the 1830s. He toured America extensively over a number of years. During the course of seven tours of the United States, John Nelson Darby would meet men such as D.L. Moody, one of the most famous evangelists ever to cross the Atlantic and proclaim the gospel in these lands. Moody would land for the first time in 1872 and is well known for his evangelistic crusades with Ira Sankey. D.L. Moody was directly influenced in his theology and his eschatology by John Nelson Darby. Darby's belief in the restoration of Israel and the return of the Lord fired that entire movement which gave rise to men like D.L. Moody, William E. Blackstone, Cyrus Schofield, and so on and so forth. These men, in turn, would leave a legacy that would have a profound impact on the events of 1917. 1891 is a critical year. This is 10 years after the outbreak of pogroms in Russia against the Jewish people when whole communities were butchered. Many Christians like William E. Blackstone can't sit back and let this happen. They can't just pray. They've got to do something. And so in 1891, William Blackstone draws up a petition containing 400 signatures which he presents to President Harrison and Secretary of State James Blaine. This petition calls on the American president to use his influence on the monarchs, the czars, the princes, the prime ministers of Europe to convene a conference to discuss the plight of the Jewish people. Although nothing actually came of the petition in 1891, it was represented several years later in 1917, the year of the Balfour Declaration, to the then US President, 
Woodrow Wilson, a Bible-believing Christian who also believed in the restoration of the Jews to the land, as it was known then of Palestine. Honest believers in the Bible who declare themselves to be followers of God should never ignore violent, evil acts of hatred toward the Jews by the enemies of God. It is simply a faithless, fearful, inconsistent lifestyle that would permit silence in the face of evil. And although much of the world was silent or even participated in wickedness, not all Christians ignored the plight of God's people. A few rose to the occasion and at least tried to stop the madness. Perhaps they shared the Cyrus call. Back in England, Henry Grattan Guinness was writing books on eschatology. In 1886, it was one of the main books which became very, very popular that Henry Grattan published. Uh, he was talking about the closing of the times of the Gentiles. And he mentions in there that one of the dates he foresaw, and he wasn't predicting what would happen. This is important. He's not a futurologist trying to be sensational. He's just saying, as Jerusalem was destroyed bit by bit in the Babylonian era, first Nebuchadnezzar coming along, so there'll be a gradual return in a reverse process. And he saw dates there mentioned in Daniel, measured not just in our use, usual calendar years, but lunar years, so it's a bit more complex, of which one significant date he saw and published in 1886 would be 1917. Now, he didn't predict what would happen, but he said it might be a momentous date for the return of the Jews to the land. Now, of course, with hindsight, we know some significance about that. But these were well known and much talked about. He also had in his Bible, uh, which I've got here, which he wrote copious notes and calculations in his margins of the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, uh, uh, he shared with his family that he saw 1948 as the another date that he saw highly significant in the return of the Jews to the land. 1917 and 1948. Do you know the significance of these momentous years as they relate to the restoration of the Jewish people to the land of Israel? Please stay tuned and listen for the Cyrus Call. For century after century in exile, the Jewish people recited the daily Amidah prayer, calling upon the Lord to regather the Jewish people from exile. And one prayer every year at Passover, next year in Jerusalem. The whole Bible shows that God has a special affection for Israel. It's the final gathering of the Jewish nation from the four quarters of emerge from centuries of political obscurity. Britain's Cyrus role to pave the way for the restoration of the Jews to the Promised Land had begun. That the destiny of Britain was actually to be the restorer of Israel, the Cyrus nation in the sovereign purposes of God. Meanwhile, on continental Europe in the mid-1890s, Jewish nationalist hopes came to the fore as a result of a resurgence of anti-Semitism following the Dreyfus Affair. In the late 1880s, 1890s, there is a young man living in Vienna by the name of Theodor Herzl. He is an acculturated Jewish journalist. He has a Christmas tree. He doesn't circumcise his son. Being a journalist, he looks around. He starts to become increasingly worried about anti-Semitism in Central and Eastern Europe. And finally, he concludes in 1895 that the Jews have no choice but to leave. They must evacuate Europe as soon as possible. Residing in Vienna at the same time was a Church of England minister by the name of William Heschler. William Heschler, who was half German, half British, was a devout restorationist. 
All his life, he had looked for the return of the Jewish people to Palestine. By God's grace, he was appointed a few years earlier to be the British chaplain at the embassy in Vienna. In 1896, William Heschler is walking through the streets of Vienna, and there he saw a copy of Herzl's book in a shop window, Der Judenstadt, the Jewish state. And soon afterwards, he met Theodore Herzl. And Theodore Herzl explained his vision to the Reverend Heschler. And the chaplain of the British Embassy became very excited. And he says, I know key influential people all over Europe. I can help you. And I can especially get you an audience with the German Kaiser. And from that moment on, from March 1896 until 1904, when Theodore Herzl died, William Heschler was at his side, advising, helping, engaging in diplomatic missions for Theodore Herzl and the Zionist movement. You might say that William Heschler was the foreign minister of Zionism, especially in those early years. The hopes of the Jewish nationalists now lay with Germany. Kaiser Wilhelm II was now the one who was seen as the Cyrus who would restore Israel in her ancient homeland. Heschler arranged for Herzl to meet with the German Kaiser when they visited the Promised Land in 1898. The first meeting took place at Mikveh Israel as the Kaiser journeyed from Jaffa to Jerusalem. Behind me is the place where the two men met initially on October 28, 1898, and then again several days later in Jerusalem. And the outcome was negative. The Kaiser's rebuff of Herzl's proposal was to be expected. Germany was trying to forge a geopolitical alliance with Turkey, and fostering a Jewish homeland in Palestine ran counter to Turkish ideology. Now, for the first time, the Jewish nationalists themselves began looking to Britain to be their Cyrus. But unlike the situation in 1840, this time it was the initiative of the Jewish people themselves. Jewish nationalist hopes now lay with Britain taking control of their promised land. Although that looked unlikely at the turn of the 20th century, a number of leading politicians came from an evangelical background and were sympathetic to the restorationist vision. We have a letter from um, Grattan Guinness's um, second wife, where she said that he'd had a letter from Balfour, who'd said he was reading Grattan Guinness's books and um, found them very, very interesting. Balfour has written to me, Henry Tobler, to say he's so interested in my books, but not only that, that he studied them closely. However, on the eve of the First World War, it seemed that if the Turkish Empire was to collapse, France would gain the region of Syria, including its southern area, Palestine. The assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1914 plunged Europe into the abyss. Turkey joined with the German and Austro-Hungarian alliance against Britain, France and Russia, all of whom had their own conflicting objectives for the Holy Land. Before long, German officers appeared in Jerusalem and were based at the large German Augusta Victoria complex on the Mount of Olives. All British subjects left Palestine. A year into the war, in 1915, the strategic importance of southern Syria, also known as Palestine, was once again of paramount importance to the British government. Britain was in control of the Suez Canal, Egypt and theoretically the Sinai Peninsula. However, she was vulnerable to a joint attack mounted by Turkish and German forces in Palestine, which could cut off the Suez, 
her lifeline to India and her Eastern Empire. Then her ally Russia issued a request for assistance. The British and the French then began working on a combined campaign to break through the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus, enter the Black Sea and provide supplies to their beleaguered ally in the north. At that point, Russia issued an ultimatum. If and when the strategic locations as well as Constantinople were captured, they needed to be handed over to Russia. This could be problematic in the future for Britain and her hold on Cyprus as well as Suez and the link to the east. The French already had an expectation of ruling over all of Syria, which included Palestine. French control of the eastern shore of the Mediterranean could potentially threaten Britain's interests further south. Britain now had one primary objective, to ensure that her link to India and the Eastern Empire was safely guarded. In other words, Britain needed a satisfactory buffer zone. A Jewish parliamentarian, Herbert Samuel, came up with a solution that would safeguard that objective in a conversation with Foreign Secretary Edward Gray. I spoke to Sir Edward Gray today about the future of Palestine. In the course of our talk, I said that now that Turkey had thrown herself into the European war and that it was probable that her empire would be broken up, the question of the future control of Palestine was likely to arise. The jealousies of the great European powers would make it difficult to allot the country to any one of them. Perhaps the opportunity might arise for the fulfilment of the ancient aspiration of the Jewish people and the restoration there of a Jewish state. Nineteen seventeen and nineteen forty eight both proved to be momentous years. Please do not miss our next episode of Crosstalk. We're going to explore incredible events that led to the fulfillment of God's ancient promises to the Jewish people. Remember, if God was of the nature to renege on His covenant with the Jews, what confidence would you have that He might not renege on His promises to the church? The truth is that our God is faithful. Come back for compelling evidence and more of the Cyrus call. Till then, Shalom and God bless you. Because He loves me, I will follow Him. Because He loves me, because He loves me, because He loves me, I will follow Him. Because He loves me, I will follow Him.